let's get the show started, shall we? Uh, I have the wrong document open. <laughs> I'm a professional. Uh, welcome. Episode 72, Season 8, Episode 9 of uh, Behind the Screen. This series is focusing on uh, Pugmire. Uh, and specifically on an adventure that I wrote uh, to promote the Realms of Pugmire Kickstarter uh, titled A Ball to Die For. Uh, and I am going through and I'm tidying up my notes and making them into an adventure that other people can use should they so choose. Uh, quick disclaimer, I do not speak for Onyx Path, nor is this project official material. All views and opinions expressed are my own. This material will be available to buy on Canis Minor eventually. I am merely a grateful fan of the platform. Uh, I am disabled. I do experience muscle twitches, stutters. Uh, sorry, I do experience muscle twitches and spasms, which can lead to um, a worsening of my normal stutter uh, or, or slurring of speech, depending on where the muscle spasms occur. If it becomes too much, I will uh, either stop the stream or just simply close the webcam for a moment to try and get it under control. Uh, I do struggle with multiple trains of thought, so um, if uh, I'm talking about something, just realised why the background music is so quiet. Let's raise that slightly. Uh, so if I am uh, talking about something and I uh, see that someone in chat has raised a point or, or something that I, I feel deserves addressing, uh, I will try to continue what I was talking about and then uh, address it. If, if I feel like it's going to be a while for me to, to, re to loop back around to that point, I will try to acknowledge it uh, at the time. Uh, that brings me to the next point. Please do feel free uh, to type in chat. This is uh, very much a, a community show. Um, I'm the, the writing in the background is something to do while no one's asking me questions, but feel free to ask questions about GM tips, writing content for role-playing games, running content, uh, running role-playing games, uh, streaming role-playing games to some extent, or just my experiences as a community content writer in general. Uh, I think that covers like the general gist of things without going into the specifics, which we'll go into later. So as ever, and as always, uh, I need to find the chat box. There it is. We'll cover the Monday meeting notes first. The Monday meeting notes are the best place to go uh, for uh, Onyx Path updates. Um, this week, uh, we've got um, uh, a, a, a recap from, from, from some of the senior um, writers and stuff about how halfway through 20, how things look halfway through 2023. Boy, time flies. Uh, so definitely read that if you're interested in their opinion on how things are going. Uh, the next backer kit will be the, the next crowdfunding campaign will be Trinity Continuum uh, Aegis. I nearly said adventure out of habit, but, but it's Aegis, uh, which you can sign up for at the link I've just posted in chat. Uh, and uh, that will be July 25th at 2pm, so that's a week from today, as of time of recording. Um, and then in some order, but not necessarily this one, the remaining crowdfunding campaigns of the year that, they've, that have been announced certainly will be Titans Rising, which is the second Titanomachy book for Cyan 2nd Edition, The World Below, and uh, the Abyssal Splat book for Exalted 3rd Edition. Uh, they're also, Onyx Path are also looking at a whole bunch of other things that they can add to uh, crowdfunding campaigns such as dice, coins, icons, clothing, bags, etc, etc. So if you have any thoughts about that, obviously let them know in the comments on the blog. Do not tell me here, because I'll have to relay that message and there's every chance I'll forget. Uh, different printing solutions have been explored. Um, Apologies. Uh, Onyx Path are planning to have uh, some sort of presence at Game Hall Con, Save Against Fear, and PAX Unplugged, uh, as w uh, w with both uh, their own booth and sharing space with sales partners, Indie Press Revolution, and All Studio Two. Website stuff continues to happen, um, so that's cool. The, this year, so far, has seen a bunch of Chronicles of Darkness books, a few 20th anniversary uh, World of Darkness books. Um, Exalted Essence obviously came out. Crucible of Legends is now over for approval at Paradox, and the Monday meeting notes are full of uh, art from Crucible of Legends. Uh, they came from, and Trinity Continuum obviously continues to to um, to release supplements. 
and some some Scion projects are in the works. Uh, so that's all. That's all pretty cool. That's all pretty cool. Uh, sales, however, uh, Drive Through RPG has the. Ex, uh, has the Christmas in July sale or Xmas in July sale if you prefer. Most of Onyx Path's back catalogue are 20 to 25 percent cheaper than they ordinarily are. So if you've been waiting to pick up some PDF material, now is the time. Uh, obviously, check that it's discounted first. Studio Two is having a sale on a bunch of physical books and uh, storytell uh, well, screens, let's say. And Roll Twenty is having a sale that includes uh, a selection of Onyx Path virtual tabletop items in their store. So there we go. Uh, I touched on the crowdfunding campaign, but again, it's Trinity Continuum Aegis. Uh, this week, the path, cr the path cast crew talk about Trinity Continuum Adventure. Uh, as usual, the all of the dates for the schedule, all of the times for the schedule that I'm about to read out to you, are in Eastern uh, Daylight, I believe. Uh, 9 a.m. today. Congrats, it's me. Uh, Saturday, 9 p.m. Changeling: The Lost Viva Las Vegas. Sunday, 6 p.m. Scion Godsend, and Monday, 5 p.m. Scion Hero: The Beginner's Guide with Awkward GM. And if you haven't been checking those out, you probably should, uh, because they're the media highlight of the week. Uh, that's they're all up on they're up on YouTube. So there's a there's a playlist. Uh, so uh, yeah, second week running. Corbin's made it through to to the media highlight of the week. Congratulations to Corbin. And um, yeah, and you, uh, if if you do if you do uh, if you do click on through for those, please of course let let leave comments, interact with the videos, power that YouTube algorithm as best you can. Because it's a thing that we're all dealing with uh, from you know this side of the ta uh, of the streaming setup and content creation. Uh, okay, so the they came from beneath the sea. Core cool rules expansion is is on sale in Roll Twenty. Um, so that's cool. Sound jump starts also on sale in Roll Twenty. So that's also cool. A couple of other things, obviously. Uh, on sale this week, Howls of the Apocalypse, three full chronicles for World of the Apocalypse 20th Anniversary Edition. So please do check that out on Wednesday if you are interested in World of the Apocalypse 20th, 20th Anniversary Edition. Uh, conventions, Game Hall Con, October 19th to 22nd, um, now lists on Xpath on their exhibitor list, so that's pretty neat. Uh, game Night... Oh, and Studio 2 booth at PAX Unplugged, uh, December 1st to 3rd, will have an Onyx Path presence. Game Night with Onyx Path Publishing this month is on Trinity Continuum in celebration of the upcoming Aegis crowdfunder campaign. Uh, that is a week this Friday, so the 28th of uh, July. But obviously you can, you, can, you can put up any game you want and start playing dot games. Uh, project status updates in manuscript approval, Taste a Bit, Scion, Dragon Library. There's a lot of co colons in that. Uh, Post-approval development, which is very exciting. They came from the Cyclops' Cave. They came from Witchfit Academy. Hey, that's that's a book I contributed to. Wonderful. That's in post-approval development. That is highly exciting. Exalted Deeds Yet Undone, uh, which used to be the Exalted Essence Adventure Trilogy. In editing, they came from Heroes of Action and Wonder. Uh, and a tasty bit, they came from Classified Hotel Lobby. Art direction from... Uh, art direction, we've got... Uh, Exalted 3rd Edition, 8 Direction, Scion, Titans, Rising, Trinity Continuum, Aegis, Kickstarter, Trinity Continuum, Aberrant with Great Power, in Layout, Legacies of Earth, uh, Proofing, Exalted 3rd Edition, Crucible of Legends, Mage 20, Lore of the Traditions, and Trinity Continuum, Assassin's VTT Adventure. And then at press, Trinity Continuum, Animus getting Serata input, Trinity Continuum, Adventure, Rulebook, Story Guide Screen, and Booklet. Exhausted Essence, World of Twenty Apocalyptic Record, Book, Screen, and Booklet, Mage, uh, The Awakening Time of the Pentacle, World Below Ashcan, and House of the Apocalypse are all at various at press, either printer quotes or print on demand proofs being ordered, and all of that stuff. And yesterday's reason to celebrate was the birthday of uh, White Wolf developer and tiny bit of Ice Path development work, also. There we go. So I'm going to hydrate because that was a lot to get through in like 10 minutes. Okay, before we go any further, as I have said, uh, this um, this season of the show is about a Pugma, is about an adventure that I wrote uh, for an actual play to promote the um, Realms of Pugma Kickstarter earlier in the year. Uh, the adventure is called A Ball to Die For, and I uh, 
I caved to popular demand on the Ice Path Discord uh, server and decided to write up, uh, well, to polish my notes and make them more usable so that people can actually use them to run the adventure. So, uh, that's what this is about. If you don't know, Pugmire is a... So, so Realms of Pugmire is the second edition of the game. The first edition was called Pugmire because it was just like a choral book and the setting of Pugmire, choral book and Monarchy's the Mouse setting, and then they were combined for second edition. But specifically, Pugmire um, is a game powered by the open gaming license, so it uses, it uses the core um, kind of fifth edition rule set mechanics uh, to simulate what if you played dogs, uplifted dogs, anthropomorphic dogs, in a world many, many hundreds, thousands of years after humanity disappeared. And you're dealing with 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 rebuilding, like with, with relearning what you can of humanity and, and the world that they left behind. Uh, so that's the, the the core gist of it. So it, it does deal with some terminology that that, that, that Dungeons and Dragons players may be familiar with, uh, and it does deal with some alter terminology that it might be familiar, or you'd be able to 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 deduce the meaning of. Uh, but um, because this is an adventure that has already been run, if you have any interest whatsoever in watch in, in knowing in, in watching the adventure first, uh, I've just dropped the link in the Twitch chat. Uh, I should probably drop it in the YouTube video description as well. Actually, thinking about it, um, here be spoilers essentially because obviously we're talking about the adventure uh, and stuff. Um, so. Oh, that's what happened. I saw movement and I got very confused. Uh, spoiler warning throughout, although it has been more than two weeks. Uh, so um, it depends how you feel about spoiler warnings, I guess. Uh, so, so far, uh, this this season, which is like a mid-season season, because season, I've, I've taken a break from, from what I was writing to, to do this, uh, while it was still relevant. Uh, so far, I've discussed my philosophy of, of broadly having, you'll get about three scenes per average three-hour session. Uh, of writing to the time limits um, imposed upon you by by the actual play actual play format, particularly when you're running a promotional actual play, uh, and you have uh, the obviously the length of the crowdfunding campaign as well as player availability to to, de to deal with, um, and obviously, scene is a malleable term, um, and as with any pre-written material i can only give you the basics of a, of a scene your players will will almost certainly ask questions that i cannot foresee them asking and, and get sidetracked by things that i could not predict uh so so this is this is i try to include as much material as i can while not making it prescriptive because uh, that's the always the difficulty i find when writing adventures um you know the Sandbox, railroad, compromise kind of conversation, uh, and then, but with with each of the scenes in my adventure, I've been including some commentary about why the scene exists, uh, what I would do, what the scene purpose was. Uh, I've been including some. Why is there a? Okay, Just random bunch of X's, uh, as well as the key information from the scene and uh, tips about how I would address, uh, uh, like, the things where I felt like the scene didn't go so well. Uh, mostly that was the prologue. Everything else kind of went mostly smoothly. Um, but I, I kind of want this to be a, hey, here's an adventure, learn from my mistakes, here's things that you can do with it that might make it better for your table, uh, and, and things of that nature. Uh, and because none of these meetings happened on stream, I'm not talking about them, not not not, not discussing them. Uh, the spoil I need to rewatch the video to remember the um, barkeep's name that I invented as I never actually wrote that down because I am quite frankly amazing uh, but I do need a little tip section down here oops no uh, be tip uh, the players may want to 
learn more about the world and Mountain uh, without meeting the nobles. The spoil and the smelting pot, I think I called it. Yes. In particular, particular, particular. I don't know why. I'm. I apologize to the our Italian audience. Um. That was terrible. I don't know why. I. Moving on. But that means there was the spoil and the smelting pot. The smelting pot in particular are a uh, great place uh, to introduce. Local color as uh, well as seed foods. I guess the spoil is would be more accurate. Uh, this is uh, things played out. The actual play where PC spent a chunk of, uh, spent some time talking to XXXX the smelting pot owner uh, I don't think I have any particular tips about the Tunnels, especially. So I think I'm good to move on to what I was, what I wanted to talk about today, actually, um, with the showdown. Um, yeah. So, uh, Control B, commentary. Sorry, I uh, Dark Horrible Sing Along blog kind of broke me for a large portion of my formative years. That's a lie. I came to Doc Horrible's quite late in the game. Uh, but the, the musical commentary kind of tickles me still. Uh, so, commentary. Um, I guess I'll talk about stuff and then we'll write it down. Uh, so, the showdown, obviously, it's intended to be a. Showdown. Uh, it's, it's the climax of the actual play. I wanted to... When... Um, Long-time viewers of the show will, will know that I've got this thing of low-stakes scene and then um, like a, an investigative social side of scene, uh, social style scene, and then uh, like a climactic action scene. Uh, for basically any kind of introductory game. And this this was an introductory scenario. None of the players have played Pugmire before. Obviously, I never played Realms of Pugmire before because it wasn't a thing beforehand. Um, so I, I, I wanted to... I, I, I Not consciously, but, you know, because that's just how my brain works and, and to this point... At this point, it's ingrained in me. Uh, this adventure still follows that setup of, of the low stakes scene as the prologue. And... Um, everything that happens before the characters get to Houghton. Then you've got the investigation and social stuff of the Houghton um, meeting the nobles, uh, of investigation and social stuff in Houghton, sorry, with meeting the nobles and f possi well, possibly meeting the nobles, figuring out what happened with the relic, um, things of, of, of that nature. Uh, and then the, the combat is you get to the Transylvania Hounds, former estate, uh, and there's a, there's a showdown. Um, but encounters, whether social, uh, yeah, whether social exploratory or combat, to me always need a, a purpose. Well, not always. Mostly should have a purpose. They, they they should be there for a reason. Now, sometimes obviously it's good to throw in one that has no bearing to the plot or anything you're trying to do at all. It's just there for color. Um, but even then, its purpose is to kind of build on the world itself rather than the story you're telling. Uh, so. Every time I do a random encounter, that quotes random encounter, um, or uh, 
of any kind, or a scripts encounter of any kind, I try to put some thought into what purpose that encounter um, has, you know? Uh, so if you watch the actual play, um, in the first session, uh, I ask the players uh, what they encounter on the way to Houghton. And this is a this is just a, like a, a cool GM tri trick that I use for player buy-in, uh, because they give themselves a reason to engage with the game. Uh, particularly if you're running for a group that you don't know very well. Uh, in this instance, uh, the players and I had never met before, apart from just through email, you know, arranging the actual play. Um, asking them for their input in the adventure gives them some stakes in it as a person, and also it kind of tells you a little bit about what they like to see in the game. Uh, so when they had the random encounter idea of a squirrel, I was like, okay, so I know that... So this is, this is just going to foreshadow things. Um, it doesn't have to necessarily make complete narrative sense, and in fact, it made zero narrative sense. But it was just a way of um, it was just a way of foreshadowing what was to come. So when they said squirrel, I was uh, it, mentally, of course, in those split seconds that any GM has to improvise an encounter on the spot. Uh, I knew that it wasn't going to be a normal squirrel. Uh, they'd said it as a joke. I was treating it completely seriously. Uh, it wasn't going to be a normal squirrel. It was going to tie in somehow to the cult of Labo Tor, who were always going to be the villains of this adventure. I'd say villains, the perpetrators of this adventure. And how can I tie those things together to foreshadow what's actually happening um, in Hampton itself? And the obvious answer there was genetic manipulation. And uh, I don't think it particularly came across, um, but the giant rat in the spoil heap and the squirrel. Uh, that the players uh, met in that first encounter were supposed to mirror each other uh, and the cult is essentially trying to uplift animals um, they're trying to replicate what man did to to them well to you know their ancestors the gigantism uh, and just homicidal fury being the, the side effects of their failed experiments uh, so then i drew on uh, the fact that because it's wasn't able to function as its biology intended it to the like the, the teeth just kept growing because they couldn't bite properly and eat properly to what grind the teeth down um so that's where that came from for anyone who watched the actual play i was curious that was my that was my uh rationale that's why i don't know uh, if this is the case with rats but i know with mice that they chew constantly to keep their teeth because their teeth grow constantly so they have to keep the teeth um, worn down anyway uh so that was that Second encounter, obviously, one of the players pointed out that they were a merchant and they were looking for, um, well, they used to be a merchant, and they were looking for other merchants to talk to on the way, uh, and that encounter purpose was to give them some insight into Houghton uh, and to build up the, uh, the mythos of the adventure a little bit, talking about the ball uh, and the families, and to give them some information about what they might, uh, ex what they could possibly expect going into uh into the adventure um you'll be you you'll you you'll so so that was that was really it um a, a lot of the time when i talk about when i when i have a love-hate relationship with random encounter tables in that a lot of the time if you're doing anything remotely off piece they don't kind of they don't fit very well but they can they do serve as good inspiration um, and I'm not poo-pooing the idea of a random encounter of an encounter table. I think that they have they have their own place and they are a very good tool. Uh, but when writing adventures, obviously you kind of need your specifics to fit the adventure. Um, and I don't think I've ever run an encounter from an encounter table as the table as written in the table. I've always tweaked it to fit, which is obviously you know just my predilection. If you want to run a random encounter as written in the encounter table. By all means, go for it. I'm not saying you can't. I'm not saying that's good practice. Um, it doesn't suit my style. That's that's all. My 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 philosophy that the encounter should serve a purpose beyond just here's an encounter or experience. Um, so you'll notice um, that those were the only two like kind of random encounters because I asked the players for their input and asked them what they wanted to see. Other ways you can handle it is you have um, a handful of encounters in the back of your mind. Uh, that can build on world information uh, for like travel scenes. M this is most particularly during travel scenes, of course. Um, 
uh, and I will often use travel uh, scenes to build on world information. That's just personal preference again. Uh, and so I'll often have kind of some en encounters in the back of my mind, and those I will ask the players to roll for to see if they trigger them. Um, again, I just like giving the players that sense of interaction with the game. If they are making a roll and they roll um, whatever value you decide on for an encounter to happen, differs based on game and GM. Uh, and obviously, if you're using a range of values and it's a more dangerous area, that range is going to be bigger than it ordinarily perhaps would be. Uh, but they're interacting, they're focused, they're paying attention, they're engaged. Because the, the last thing that anyone wants is an unengaged player, obviously. And, um, oh, sorry, it's hard to see, but I've got some, like, short bits of hair that keep tickling my nose, which is why I keep brushing my fringe out my face. Uh, I just like having my hair down, uh, but I've got a fan on. Anyway, sidetrack. Um, yeah, so player engagement is incredibly important, obviously. Uh, so that's generally why I will ask them to roll and then because I have a selection of encounters in the back of my mind I'll ask them to roll like a d4 and that will determine which encounter they choose. It's kind of very standard GMing um, stuff for anyone who uses random encounters um, particularly in the d20 system uh, so I'm not really breaking new ground here uh, but going to personal design philosophy um, social encounters obviously mostly low stakes sometimes there is the, ch the chance that they will they will uh, devolve into uh, violence, but that's that's dependent on you, play characters, the players themselves, what kind of feel you want at the game. Social encounters are mostly going to be information or resource sharing, uh, or a chance for the players to gain allies that they would ordinarily not gain uh, by just happening upon people on the way. Uh, exploration encounters obviously are more of a, hey, here's a cool bit of the world, going to hint at some lore, maybe some history. It doesn't really have any terrible bearing on the game unless you want it to, like I do a lot of the time. Oh, on the story, sorry, not the game. Uh, but here's just this neat little world inf info. Gives you a moment and time that you have uh, that, you, that you have encountered. And then obviously there's the combat side of things, which I'll get into in a moment. However, um, Looping all the way back to what I said earlier about getting player input about encounters, uh, I often do this. Um, if and you can combine the two, you can you can not. So you can just straight up say during the travel, what kind of thing do you encounter, and then get someone to suggest something, and then make an encounter based on that. You can get them to roll for an encounter, and then if they do hit that value that determines that triggers an encounter, then ask them what they encounter. Uh, obviously, if you're doing it that way around, hello, congrats, uh, th thank you so much for the, uh, for the for the Prime Gaming subscription and welcome to the show. Um, we appreciate that support. Um, how are you doing? Where was I? You know, I've completely forgotten. This is this is why I try not to distract myself, but it happens anyway. Uh, encounters, social encounters, player buy in. Yeah, so so if they hit the um, hit that value that triggers an encounter, you can then ask them what they encounter, and they could suggest one thing, expecting um, one kind of thing, and then you throw them a curveball by doing something else. Uh, so, like uh, one of uh, one of the times I did this, um, not in the the Pugmire IP, because I've talked about that already today. Um, uh, one of the times I did this was a player threw out that they encounter a corpse surrounded by plants. And uh, I'm assuming that they were as expecting that to be like, a, hey, here, these plants are carnivorous, they'll attack us and we'll have a short combat encounter. Uh, but I actually used that to as an exploration encounter instead. Uh, I gave, I, it was, there was, there were some resources nearby that the corpse had been running towards, including a map of the area, which they didn't have. Uh, and you know, it, 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 everyone had a cool little scene uh, that everyone enjoyed, and they, they learned a bit more about the world and got a bit more invested because they they chose that um, encounter. I will say, I will caveat all of this. I'm not prefacing it because that comes before. This is an afterfus, a postfus. I don't know. Uh, we'll we'll say I'll caveat it with this doesn't work for every group. Uh, some people just aren't comfortable improvising that degree of um, stuff or in the moment can't think of anything. Uh, so very much run it by your group first, uh, by your players first. 
And obviously it involves you trusting your players to suggest reasonable things. Uh, fun, fa uh, fun, fun, fun thing though, if they suggest a non-reasonable thing. OBS, why are you being non-reasonable? Or unreasonable, I suppose is the word. Um, uh, roll with it. Just just be facetious. Take it. Make it your own. Because uh, everyone else will laugh. Will have. Uh, in my experience, people just laugh about it. Uh, and it's a memorable encounter because it's so left wing. Left field? Left field. Uh, that, you know, it's, it sticks. They're like, you remember that time that so-and-so made a joke and the GM ran with it and it was a great scene? Uh, obviously, if it's a bad scene, people will also remember it for other reasons, but there we go. Um, so there we go. Social encounters usually purpose is... Recap, social encounters usually have the purpose of resources, allies, information sharing. Exploration encounters are will, usually world building and then combat encounters obviously are designed to challenge the players. Uh, and this is what our main bulk of today of today's conversation will be for about the next hour or so, I imagine. Um, I'm hoping it doesn't take that longer than that to write up the scene. But there we go. So, uh, I will talk about my encounter design uh, philosophy and then uh, I'll start writing the commentary for the scene and, and the scene information itself, which should allow my ideas to percolate in your grey matter and you can hit me back with all of that. No, you're wrong because X and criticise me constructively. Um, which is what we all need. Uh, or maybe I, I'll talk about something that you've never considered before. So, although it, it's encounter design, it's perhaps one of the simplest things to do in a role-playing game, uh, particularly one such as D20 where, uh, oh, you know, fifth edition OGL material, uh, where there is a decent focus on combat encounters. There's no two, I, there's no two ways about it. The, the game's kind of built around them. Um, so there's already a lot of structure put into the game. But uh, to me, I I very rarely throw in a fight just to have a fight. I like it to serve a purpose. And I will tailor the encounter based on that purpose. So, for example... Ignoring the showdown for a moment. The brawl! The scene above it. Though, didn't appear on the, in the actual play because the players never interacted with the huskies. Uh, sorry, with the wolfhounds. Uh, that encounter was not supposed to be particularly challenging. Uh, it was supposed to be a demonstration of the power of one of the noble houses to uh, put them off this, to, to, to interact with the party through expendable pawns and to be a demonstration of might rather than this is seriously going to challenge the players because uh, it's a very short notice. Um, so I guess the, 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 the scene had it happened, uh, would have been, while the players were traveling through Houghton, uh, a bunch of thugs would were going to jump them from the shadows. And it was going to be like a, here's this thing, whoever organized it clearly put it together at very short notice, they're not particularly well prepared, they're not particularly well armed and armored, and you yourselves are experienced seasoned warriors. Um, obviously it's not going to be a cakewalk, but it's it was, it was, it was designed to more for the shock of it than anything else. Um, so uh, I, again, um, this was written for Realms of Pugmire, which has minion rules. Pugmire does not have minion rules, so please ignore the word minions. I mean, don't. I, I, I'm still going to write a minion rule for this adventure uh, because that's the point of the show and writing community content, you can throw your, your own rule set in. Uh, and as far as I'm aware that's allowed, I might check after the stream, and if it's not allowed, I will update the wording, and obviously I will let you all know next stream if I've had to reword anything, or remove any content. However, so, um, so as, as I uh, knew that I was running for three players, uh, and uh, I knew roughly the spread of uh, combat styles that we had, uh, that obviously allowed me to custom tailor the encounter to them, but it's mostly a pretty generic encounter that you could throw at any party, and they'd, they'd be fine with it. If uh, When I do go through um, updating the material that didn't appear in the actual play, I will have like a, hey, here's a increased throw, like two more minions into it for a four-player party, or 
two more minions and an extra heavy for a five player party, etc. That kind of scaling mechanic, uh, scaling advice. Um, again, I knew the players, the, the characters I was playing for, or the characters I was writing for, so I could, I could challenge, I could address their skill set. Uh, so it was it was supposed to be kind of like um, a glass cannon encounter in a way. It was, it was like they kill they they come out hard, sw um, come out swinging. Sorry, heavy hitting, uh, but they're not. It's not actually that difficult an encounter. Um, so I love minion rules. Uh, I I love the con the idea that there's just some. Uh, you can empower the players by giving them, like, essentially freebies um, by having one health enemies for them to just deal with and move on from. Uh, I think a lot of, a lot of not just D20 systems, but a lot of role-playing games that have a focus on combat kind of just evolve into a slog as the numbers go up and up and up, and it's not always fun, and it can drag things out, and you can really lose narrative pace uh, by something either going too slowly because there's just too many hit points involved, or too quickly, because you yourself are rolling terribly. Um, this is something that I encountered a lot during a 5th a edition, ca edition campaign I ran. And every... I, I try to take the lessons I've learned from any role-playing game I've played and apply them to my own work, my own writing for community content. And uh, minion rules are definitely one way for that. Having a one health or, or, you know, you can give them more than one hit point or stamina, sorry, point if you want. Uh, but they should ideally go down in one hit, two at the most, um, unless they've got some kind of special rule. Uh, but they're, they're, minions kind of exist to make the players look awesome. Uh, particularly in a game where you're trying to touch all three kind of scene bases with social investigation and combat. And if you have a character that's focused on social and a character that's focused on investigation and a character that's focused on combat, you want them all to shine. Um, so having that minion there for them to hit and to take out the fight just because they are awesome uh, really kind of makes the player feel good and obviously speeds things along. Uh, you'll notice I've also got heavies, elites and leader as just shorthand to myself. Uh, heavies are chunkier enemies that um, hit hard, but can't necessarily take a lot of punishment in return. Uh, I don't have... Uh, when I'm writing short notes for my own encounters, I also include troops, which is kind of like the generic mook, uh, bad guy, um, antagonist, sorry. The, uh, they're the foot soldiers. Heavies are just a specialized kind of troop um and then elites they're, they're elites they're they're harder to take out than the heavies they're usually capable of taking and dealing a respectable amount of damage by themselves and then if they're working together they're quite a threat and then a leader obviously is just usually in a d20 system particularly in this case the highest uh, challenge rating creature um antagonistic creature in the scene um, because they usually have the most health they usually deal the most damage and sometimes they are capable of buffing uh, the creatures um, that they're fighting alongside. Uh, also, you've got like scouts or assassins or whatever you want to call them, which are glass cannons um, that can do a staggering amount of damage but don't actually take that much damage in return or can be shut down quite easily or dealt with in another way uh, as another subset of the troop archetype um, that I use in my shorthand when I'm writing adventures for myself uh, or drafting encounters I suppose so so yeah with, so my, my reasoning was three minions and two heavies um, allows me to put out a reasonable amount of damage um, as they come out swinging with the element of surprise but then the minions go out in one or two hits. Well, I mean, they're, they're using rules of Pugmire rules, so they go in one hit. Um, which, as you can see from that that numerical distribution, uh, more than halves the opponents on the on on the field. Uh, and then the two heavies that are left um, get in a few good licks, and then probably just run away because they're not there to die; they're there to send a message. 
Uh, and as the notes underneath says, they confess to being hired to scare the characters off. The point of the encounter is not to kill the characters, it is to intimidate them. And you can do this in you know, any game system. If you want an encounter to not be uh, to the death, but as an intimidation tactic, uh, just hard-hitting enemies. They don't have to... They could, you could throw it. You, you could you could throw enemies at the player antagonists at the players that the players, the PCs realistically won't be able to deal with, um, and you know give them that thing to strive towards of of like we're going to come back we're going to deal with you in a meaningful way later, um, and I I, I I definitely feel that when it comes to intimidation certainly f uh, from an antagonist's perspective. Unless you have a very specific thing in mind, uh, just make it as overt as possible. Just the biggest, nastiest antagonists you can field. Just throw them at the players. Um, this one, the players were supposed to be able to beat because it gives them information. Uh, but if you don't want them to be able to beat it, obviously just pick big, heavy um, creatures. Uh, lots of hit points, do lots of damage. And then they just don't kill the players. They leave them alive, possibly battered, definitely bruised, but they get the message. Um, and then obviously if you, as I say, in this case, if you want it to be a message as well as to provide information, they hit hard, but they go down quite quickly. Um, and certainly with three players, after having removed that initial minion screen, three, three player characters versus two NPCs, it's going to be a, it's going to get one-sided quickly. Um, Contrast that with the showdown, which, as the climax of the adventure, uh, was supposed to be a challenging encounter. Um, and you know, I'm not sure it was in the end, but the players had fun, so that's really all that matters. Uh, you you want to throw in your leaders and your elites, um, possibly a minion screen. Uh, obviously, the trick with encounters um, in... I'm going to focus on D20 systems specifically right now, because that's what Pugmire is. D20 system uses the 5th edition OGL. Um, it's very easy to get bogged down in different NPC groups. Or to accidentally over or underwhelm your players. Um, I would hesitate using the Pugmire rule set. Less so, but mostly anything... Most other OGL games, uh, this is more warning for them. Pugmai handles it reasonably well, I would say. Uh, I would I would hesitate to throw a solo encounter at players, um, and I, I I certainly could have done in the showdown. I could have just been like, here is this high-ranking member of the Cult of Labo Tour, deal with it. But the way the action economy works out in 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 OGL uh, in D20 games. Um, I, it definitely favours player character groups. Obviously, I only had three players, so it would have been less of an issue. But if you're running through this adventure with four, five, six, or heaven forfend, more players, uh, the, the action economy is very swiftly going to um, swing your players' favour. And I will include some uh, advice in the tip section about how to handle that, how to scale the encounter for um, larger player groups. But because it was the climax, because it was supposed to be a challenging encounter, I went through the maths available to me in the playtest rules and I crafted an encounter that theoretically was suitable for, I think I worked it out as four level one characters, um, because I wanted to have that element of will they survive or won't they survive? Um, but as it turns out, they survived. Uh, by just focusing fire on the leader, which, you know, that's a strategy. Um, and if a couple of things hadn't happened, it could have gone the other way quite easily, but they would, so that's all that matters. Uh, anyway, uh, so the idea I had was was that the, the leader was probably going to take um, ideal uh, tile the melee character. So yes, the leader had a couple of ranged options, but a decent 
uh, melee uh, attacker as well. Uh, the elites were there to... Uh, the elites and minions were just there to, to kind of uh, act as a screen. Um, and obviously, like, when I'm talking about uh, antagonists in game, I don't call them... This is, I don't say, this is a minion. I let the players discover that they only have one... They have few stamina points and usually go down in one hit. Um, obviously, if you want to keep your players on their toes, there's nothing saying you can't give a minion stat block more than one stamina point. Uh, if you play this in rounds of Pugmire, obviously Pugmire f first edition it has its own thing, and I'm trying to I'm trying to convey that it's not as easy to conv to um... no, that's the wrong phrasing. Uh... There are significant differences between the two games. And um, I'm trying to not let my thinking for the actual play color, which was for the second edition, uh, color what I write here for first edition. And it is a bit tricky because I'm having to explain why, I, or I'm choosing to explain why I did what I did for the actual play, and then down like uh, work backwards, work backwards from there to express it in first edition terms. So again, there's no minions in first edition. Um, I. It's just so many games use the word minion as, the, as an archetype that I can't get away from it. Like it does what I need it to. Anyway, so uh, yeah, the, um, you can give minions um, more health than than players are expecting. Uh, they don't necessarily need to deal more damage. Uh, if you do increase their damage at that point, they're probably more of a troop than a minion. But that's again, that's entirely on you and your, your encounter design. Um, my rationale here was that with three players, I didn't want to have twice as many antagonists as player characters. Uh, it could have done, could have done with throwing more minions at them, but there's a point at which it just seems like you're being an a-hole uh, as a GM by throwing, like, just vastly outnumbering the player characters. And even minions can kill a player character if there's if there are enough of them. Um, it was a uh, So my I my rationale kind of was like I could have a bunch of troops that were just you know average members of the cult, or I could have to have a handful of elites and a handful of minions, and that will reflect kind of the strength invested in the scheme. Uh, obviously, if you've got a leader and a bunch of tr uh, of troops, it in terms of storytelling and narrative, because uh, the encounter obviously serves narrative purpose as well. In terms of storytelling and narrative, it's kind of like here is a very generic encounter where uh, it's maybe a like a lieutenant of uh, in the cult has in the cult. Sorry, emphasize the T uh, has recruited some troops to to their cause, done this thing, and now they're just cause now they're you know at, at the end, end point of their scheme. But anyone could have done it. It's just generic troops. Whereas I feel like if you have the elites and the minions, and they both, uh, rep I represent them with different stat blocks in the actual play, and I will be when I write up the um, the scene. Uh, if you have a leader who then has like more highly trained members of the cult working beneath them, and then just kind of faceless members of the cult beneath them that kind of to me at least obviously this is this is all subjective but to me that kind of highlights that this is actually a um a specialized operation it's not uh it's just they haven't tried to do this on a whim they've put thought and committed resources into it particularly as the player characters have found their lair underneath the spoil which should tell them that the rats have been here for a while and have been planning this for a long time um and to me, it was just a much more satisfying narrative um, to have that than just, here's a leader, here's some troops, have at it. Whereas uh, it was, here's a leader, here's some psychic rats, and then here's some, some, some archers that are guarding the hostages as well as taking pot shots at you. Um, if I were to run this again, I'd probably... I probably would have uh, an extra minion in the mix for an extra shot per round to make it slightly more challenging. But again, that's just how it goes sometimes. Uh, a side note on the leader. Um, 
who was in possession of the stolen relic. I don't remember if I talked about this in the epilogue. If you go to the YouTube link that I'll post at the end of the stream, or if you've been here since the beginning of the stream uh, and you go to it, you know, ne whenever you, you, you click on it. Um, I can't remember if I talked about this in the epilogue, but my general idea with the, um, the relic was just that uh, first round, uh, leader activated it, um, and then it was kind of like, a, hey, here's a steadily worsening thing you should probably deal with before it explodes. Uh, so first round it was just going to do 1d4 damage, second round 1d4 plus 1d6, third 1d4, well, had a three turn countdown to, to be fair to the players because they're first level characters, and, you know, I'd, I'd rather not kill them. Um, it's so easy to kill players at low level. Uh, and then third 1d4 plus 1d6 plus 1d8, etc, etc. After hitting 1d12, I wasn't going to add 1d20 damage. I was going to loop back around to do 2d4 plus 1d6. But by that point, the player characters will be dead. So, you know, it wouldn't really matter. But um, uh, I was going to do this. And you can apply this to high level play as well. Um, it worries players. When the GM rolls steadily increasing amounts of dice, uh, I do in I do it in the open. I don't use a screen, uh, so if I'm running in the meat space, uh, I'll roll on the table in front of the players in my dice tray. I'm not a heathen, um, and if I'm running virtual tabletop, I have my rolls as public, so my players can see uh, what I'm rolling. And uh, players do get concerned. Um, one, when they can see that you're rolling more dice, and two, when they figure out how the dice progression is, well, progressing. Uh, so it's just, a, it's just a nice trick to unsettle your players and to ha really hammer home the fact that this is a problem they should be dealing with. Uh, probably last turn, um, just, you know, just some standard GM psychology, no big deal. I'm going to hydrate again, it's been a while. Okay, so, uh, having discussed all of that, I will, um... Sorry, I'm just resetting my notes. Uh, finding the right stat blocks. There we are. Okay, so, uh, having said all that, obviously now is the time to be processing what I've said, which you know, theoretically you've already been processing, but I, I don't know, I'm not your parent. I can't read your mind. Uh, so if you do want to criticize anything or ask for clarification or provide feedback or your own viewpoint, feel free to go ahead and do so throughout all of this. Um, that was just my philosophy of encounter design, like half an hour of rambling. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and type up the scene and keep talking through my thought processes because uh, at the end of the day, this is a content creation show, and I do want to help people. I do want to help make content creation as accessible as possible to people for community content purposes. Uh, and and if I can do that by providing my um, viewpoint on things, which may not have occurred to you before, then I sure as heck will. Uh, for those who are new to the... I, don't, I realize I never really addressed the, the timing of the show particularly, but if you are new to the show, uh, the show does run for two hours, so uh, if you do have anything you want to say, you've got about uh, an hour at the most to to ask or to, to say, but uh, yeah. Uh, please enjoy the background music and the sounds of me typing and my rather um, erratic uh, delivery of my thoughts. So to recap, the purpose of this scene um, is, to, is to provide a challenging finale to the adventure. Uh, the death, well, let's say death slash serious injury of one or more uh, PC is uh, possible and the perpetrators I realize I've never had to spell perpetrator before 
don't think I've ever had spell it. That, well, that I recall, anyway. Uh, of the... Th I could just say the thieves. Let's just say the thieves. Um, uh, behind the missing relic are revealed. Uh, the players should have um, covered enough information by this point to deduce that rodents uh, are involved. Oh, oh Labo Tor! Just want to read. Just want to check something. say, for the purposes of this adventure, at least. Uh, is not well known. And so, unless... Uh, there is able to roll well on a no... I guess history? History makes the most sense. Sorry, I just need to find the... Uh, the skills list. So I can never remember where it is. Uh, is it here? Nope. I think it's somewhere around here. It is, haha. <laughs> Maybe no arcana? Uh, to roll. Um, I get. See, the, grammatically, I believe roll well is the best way of phrasing this, but roll high makes the most sense from a. Like a commentary point of view, as a, as a more informal. Uh, anyway, uh, no arcana uh, or religion. Um, check. Check. Pretty sure they kept check for this. Be under a different section. Yes, check. Cool. Uh, that's sweet dash. So, unless the player is able to roll well on a no arcana, culture, or religion check. Probably will be largely unaware of what lies ahead. Uh, if they do manage to piece together clues to uh, reveal the cult's involvement. Or strange alchemy. Weird science. Strange alchemy and silex. As a warning for what lies ahead. And then read loud text. Um, so, old room. Find yourself in 
is full of uh, moldering sacks and uh, it's full of moldering sacks. A reinforced iron door. To the castle beyond. Uh, the characters have uh, gained entry. Please, fingers. Uh, to the lower levels. Oh. Transylvanian hounds. I don't know why, I apologize. Uh, former estate. Uh, you wish to make this seem more challenging. Bandit, right? Yeah, the road rat. Use the road rat stat block from. Oh no! That's not what I want. Oh, control I, please. Thank you. I think hate control P for some reason. Uh, that needs holding. Uh, put my uh, page. What's the page reference? One eight one. Uh, for the characters to deal with. Um, From the storeroom they find themselves in. As you emerge from the rough tunnel, cut through. Uh, cut is the wrong word. Uh, dug through one wall. Through one of its walls. Locked and requires a hang on these again like because of the whole um, discussion I had the other day the other day the other stream about providing specific difficulties over um, generic difficulties uh, regarding um the capabilities of your player party. I can an average uh, difficulty for one um, and again I'll include this all in the introduction and stuff but the average average difficulty for, for one party may be different from another one. So, so for instance if in this instance um, like, a bad roll will prevent the player characters from getting through the door. Unless the GM steps in and does something to help. But if they don't have someone who can pick a lock, for example, I don't want them to... I don't want to... And somehow they fail to break the door down. I don't want to gate the... Um, you know, the, the climax of the adventure behind a, behind a dice roll. So... Uh, it's very much a scaling thing of if your players are not if no one in the group is specialized use 10 as an average difficulty if, if they are use 15 etc things of that nature um i don't know if that's clear i don't know how i phrased it last time uh
I should also say that this is definitely this is, this is something I'm experimenting with. Um, so I'm going to have I'm going to ask for feedback on this in the in the introduction to see if people like this approach to to to, diff to difficulty. Um, mostly because the content I write, I want to be as broadly applicable as possible, and to be as uh, customizable as possible. And I, I know that certainly for myself, if I read an adventure, and I've mentioned this many times before, but if I read an adventure that says the difficulty is X. Uh, in my brain, I'm like, well, the writer clearly thought that was the best difficulty for this role. It can be nothing but that difficulty. Um, whereas I'm going to probably have a table of, here are some difficulties for characters who don't specialize. And here are some difficulties for characters who do specialize. And they'll just be different, obviously. Um, just to apply for, for, for things. And obviously, as I said, if you, I'll, I'll also have some guidance in that section about if you are specialized, what that actually gives you, apart from a higher DC, because the higher difficulty, sorry, because they should, you know, or more accurately, if you're not specialized, what happens if you do manage to do it? So in this instance, like, yes, it would be an easier role, but it might take longer, or they'll probably alert a guard or, or something of that nature. I don't, as I say, I don't want the adventure to be blocked off behind a bad role. So I do want them to be able to succeed at the role, but it doesn't have to be the exact same outcome as if they had specialized in that role. Obviously, it puts more onus on the GM, uh, on the guide, sorry, but... Equally, you could just replace all of my guidance about scaling difficulty with just use a static difficulty, and that works too. I, I really don't care. I've provided this as an alternative way of playing the game, and it's up to you if you want to use it. Uh, to unlock, sorry. Um, none of the doors in the castle are... built with particularly secure locks so this difficulty um, applies to unlocking any door uh, you deem would be locked. Uh, the tunnels no, the corridor, I should say. Beyond the storeroom leads eventually to the kitchen. After passing several other doors. I for some more read loud text. Kitchen is High ceilinged and uh, 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 the word has gone. Uh, we'll go with empty for now. How's of building material? I outside the windows. Don't work around. Both the double door leading further into the estate, or into the castle, I should say. Let's say let's, I'm just going to use castle for sure, and I'll probably replace this with hall. You know, what? let's let's use hall here. Well, leading further into oh, then you have the you mean the room hall or the building hall? Uh. Keep is the wrong word. I'm trying to make this as easy as possible to avoid linguistic confusion. I would say building. Both the double door leading in further into the building and the external door. Has been recently repaired. And sounds of movement can 
because from the next room. And there is a strange fish like smell in here. Characters investigating the smell. That has no real source. Um, this is, I guess, the show is called Behind the Screen, right? Uh, ionize, the ionization of air oh. mm, produces the weird fish smell. Uh, typically, it's when. Um, electricity shorts but other things can cause it and this is a fantasy game there's n there's nothing saying that a nuclear powered relic or essentially the, the relic is a weaponized uh, core of radioactive material wouldn't ionize the air around it uh, the double door is not locked oh, uh, let's use contractions uh, the double door isn't locked I also need to add a scene heading to all of these to, between the commentary and the scene itself. Uh, the door isn't locked and opens to a large um, room. So, two rooms have been merged into one. Most of the connecting wall. Marble tiles in the floor. Clean under the brightly polished chandeliers. Smell of a storm approaching. I say the smell of rain in the air. Uh, smell of rain in the air. Uh, wafts from a large hole in the ceiling in one corner. And sound of thunder rumbles ominously. Stage has been erected against the chest high defense of the wall of the dividing wall. A white furred rat stands upon it. What you doing? Well, quarter square X. Uh, I am right. I'm well. No. Okay. So uh, currently, I'm writing disc scene description uh, in the very narrow sense. In a much broader sense, less facetious and literal sense, uh, I'm taking some notes that I wrote for a recent actual play uh, on the channel uh, and expanding upon them and using uh, and making them usable for other people uh, by other people. Sorry. Uh, with the intention of uploading this to Canis Minor when it is ready uh, for people to purchase and run uh, at, uh, at their own tables. Um, eventually, when Realms of Pugmire is released, I will update it uh, to uh, include Realms of Pugmire material and terminology. Um, if you don't know what that, what, I'm, what Realms of Pugmire is, Realms of Pugmire is the second edition of a game called Pugmire, which is essentially what if D&D, but dogs. Um, in a post, it's a post-apocalyptic post -apocalyptic fantasy game uh, where dogs and cats and things have been uplifted, kind of have this pseudo-medieval society, and are trying to kind of figure out what humanity left behind and understand what humanity wanted them to do. Um, the show specifically uh, behind the screen is also, as you can see up here, uh, just 
GM tips, content creation, anything you can think to ask, I will answer as best I can. Uh, I have, I'm not an official representative for the company. I'm just a fan of the platform. Um, but I will, as I say, answer as best I can and direct you where you may find answers if I cannot answer the question. Uh, a silver orb in one hand. Uh, a cluster of dogs cowers um, in the middle of I know Pugmire, but what's Ruins of? It's significantly different from the first one. So, Realms. Sorry, that, that, that's my bad. Uh, Realms of Pugmire is um, it's a rules update. It was on um, Kickstarter, I think it was, a couple of months ago. Uh, and it removes all of the OGL mechanics. Uh, it's a full port to the Onyx 20, Onyx 20 system. Um, I believe it's still available for pre-order on Backer Kit. Um, but it's designed more as a comprehensive thing where you'll need the Realms of Pugmire core rule book and then everything else will be supplements rather than obviously Monarchies of Mal was a core book um, and, and things of that nature. It's uh, it's got a it, it, it's more streamlined. It's got more of um, Eddie's redone like encounter balancing for uh, encounter math balancing and things of that nature. A standard kind of second edition polishing really. Uh, and um, announced during the uh, virtual con was a, 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 a manual of monsters, if you will, uh, a book of, of uh, a book full of enemies, including conversions of first edition um, creatures that didn't make it into the realms of Pugmire core book. Uh, a cluster of dogs cowers in the middle of the. Let's just say cows in in, in the foot. Uh, I've, I've written myself into a corner here. Let's say in front of the stage. As a group of rats menaces them with crossbows. Expects. Pulls up website. That's what we like to see. That's what we like to see. Uh, if you do want to see the, um, so I, it's not the, it's not full Onyx Twenty. It it is um, using uh, more of a fifth edition rules than rule set than Eddie is uh, currently working on. Uh, but I ran a play test, uh, actual play of this adventure uh, during the the crowdfunding campaign it's all up on youtube uh and that's uh, gives you some context and lets you see how how some things have changed um this was before wizards of the coast did their thing with the open gaming license uh and eddie ripped out all of the ogl material so some of it is still in the game but different and some of it is has been thrown by the wayside entirely Smell of rain in the air wafts from a large hole in the ceiling. Actually covered by a flapping top hole. And... A cluster of dogs. Almost certainly labourers. There we go. There's your read aloud text. Um, uh, the white furred rat. Sprick by their underlings uh, has his back to the kitchen door. And the 
that other rats are otherwise that are focused on the hostages. Allowing the PCs or allowing the characters, I say, uh, to position themselves or to get into position. Or whatever they choose to do. If they try to talk or reason with the rats, they are offered one chance. One chance, nope. One chance to leave. Break. Uh, orders his underlings to kill them. And the hostages. Um. Once he reaches half his stamina, or half of his underlings are skilled, I'm going to play session on actually supports the creation of the stuff. So here, well, thank you so much for those for the for those bits, quarter square X root. I really appreciate it. And we at the channel really appreciate it. If you do enjoy the show, uh, it does run every two weeks. Uh, I'll, I'll explain more in my outro uh, if you're around at that point. But yes, I, I run the show. I try to run the show every two weeks um, at this time um, as, a, as, a, to, as a way of, 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 of removing barriers into writing content for, for RPGs. I know that they, it can be quite a, a daunting thing for some people. Uh, and obviously some people... Um, might find themselves stuck in a rut and and I can help them out of it. I just want to help people get into writing content or to smooth to, to make things easier for people who just want to get into to running games in general. Or half of his underlings are killed. Chemist's brick activates the device, uh, activates the ball of heat. At that point, the characters have Three turns. Uh, it'll be rounds, sorry. I uh, have three rounds to deactivate it. No, oh, I think I did two. Also, sidebar here, I guess. Um, there's obviously a well established, well established principle: uh, the rule of three. Um, just the human brain seems to really like the rule of three for some reason. Uh, comedy boss phases, etc, etc. Uh, if you play around with that, you can get some really interesting results. So obviously, because the rule of three is so ingrained, certainly into, like, I'll, I'll just say British culture for now, but I assume same in America uh, and, and most of the West, um, because we share a lot of cultural underpinnings. Uh, if nothing happens at that third beat, then people get really confused and on edge because they don't know when something's going to happen. Uh, if you do it before, obviously it it can seem a little cheap, but it also kind of hammers home the point that in this context at least the characters have no understanding of much of humanity's works and having that activation thing, ha having it activate at the two round mark rather than the three round mark kind of just drives home, drives home the point that what they're, in what they're, what they have is something that they could never possibly understand under normal circumstances. It is incredibly dangerous. And uh, in this instance, it is a nuclear core. So it's, inc it's also quite volatile and is, 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 is something that they shouldn't treat lightly. Obviously, uh, in terms of, of narration and stuff, you should probably, as the guide, 
uh, highlight how dangerous it is and how swiftly it's activating. Um, I believe I had, I I described it having you know lights lighting up. I can't remember how many rounds I gave them to deactivate it, but in this in this instance, we're having two rounds to activate it, to deactivate it because it just seems I like playing with rule of three on occasion. Um, at that point in place, I have two rounds to deactivate the ball, uh, as denoted by two red lights on its surface. Once it is activated, it can still be deactivated. But deals um, more damage each turn after every uh, at the end of the initiative order, I believe. Hang on, now I have to double check how one e handles initiative because this was for Tui, and I've been writing Tui material. Uh, sorry, and uh, that's all I can remember, and I'm just doubting myself. There's popcorn still, I believe. Yeah, still popcorn initiative, cool. Uh, after every character has had it. First uh, I feel like this is a new paragraph. First turn it deals. 1d4, I guess fire damage is the close. Hang on, I, again, I need to check what is and isn't right in my head about damage types. Is there an index? Oh, please scroll ball. Well, oh, no, OBS has died. Oh, this is a problem, YouTube. And we're back. I've been having OBS problems the entire time. I just have I I just thought if I don't mention it nothing will happen. Thanks Twitch. Thank you for unpausing the video when I reconnected. That's uh that's not an unpleasant thing for me to hear. I don't like my own voice. Like most people. Um heat. No oh, heat is a thing in first edition. It's heat damage. First turn deals 1d4 heat damage, then 4 plus 1d6, and so on until it reaches. Plus 1d12, at which point it loops back around to 2d4 plus 1d6. Etc. Uh, it requires three successful. Uh, you know what? I think. I think the success, a check being successful is kind of implied, uh, so it requires three difficult, again, um, difficult difficulty. Uh, I'll have guidance about what I mean by, by low average and high difficulty in the introduction. It's just something I'm trying out for this. Uh, three high difficulty, um, maybe now I can't check this. Ball. Um, there we go. Uh, I guess if I go with F 
environment. Uh, the room is large and divided by chest. I will that should be hyphenated. All that can be used as cover. Uh, a section of scaffolding underneath all in the roof. as a raised platform beyond that uh, files of building materials chairs and a solid wooden table can be Repurposed and cover or improvised weapons. Large solid wooden table. Uh, uh, let's just have a, a large wooden table. Full of seating. 30 animals. Antagonists. Chemist Sprick. And Chemist Sprick uses uh, the. Uh, there we go. Smoldering Chemist. I need a page reference, thank you. One eight eight. One eight five. So close. Uh, something I don't have time to do now is go through and check the um, encounter maths. So I will have to do that off stream and probably next stream either do it live or let you know how I changed it. Of researcher with twelve stamina. Yeah. Uh, also, side note: when I ran this uh, during the actual play, I didn't use the psychic blast for the illuminated of researcher, and in hindsight, I probably should have done um, for the challenge side of things. I feel like um, I used the needle as as a telekinetic weapon instead, um, and they just get missing, I believe. Uh, but I probably should have kept the psychic blast and the sensory overload uh, trick. Um, to ramp up the difficulty slightly, but you know, it's the power of hindsight, and this is uh, things that I can. I don't have to really mention here because I assume people uh, using this adventure will not be. I got to stop pressing Control P. Gosh dang it. Um, control B, Control I, Shift P. Uh. Yeah, they, they won't be um, editing things as uh, quite as I did. Two illuminated researcher. To, uh, oh, I hit caps lock at some point. Uh, 
to assistant of Labotor. Which I hate that I put to assistant of Labotor, but I kind of is the easiest like two assistants of Labotor doesn't I'm gonna do it because it's better in my brain uh, with force demo. So they're probably gonna go down in one hit. Two if the player if the PC is unlucky. But they're there more just as a um I don't think I need to tweak the stat block any further. They're there as the minions. Right. Control B I shift P. Thank you, fingers. And that's on page one eight four. So that's all cleared there. Um Tip. Uh, what, what, what advice would I provide having run this 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 scene? Um, uh, uh, to scale this scene or larger parties. assistants or one illuminated uh, let's say alternate adding two assistants and one there we go alternate adding two assistants and one illuminated assistance or one of them sorry um, for every character for every PC over three uh, the uh, illuminated uh, sensory overload trick Easily kill a character at this level. So, as a tweak, increase its damage by one. Not per miss, or per round. That's per round unused, I guess. round instead of 1d10 because again this is a level one characters you don't want to kill them um just doing some quick maths in my head i think uh 12 stamina it'll take two average damage hits to to kill one which seems fine Advice should I provide? Oh, I should probably clarify. Uh, I use this as an action to activate the ball of heat. should I provide based on my and how I run the scene uh, I guess um, 
members are not stupid and we'll use the hostages for cover as well as cover listed the environment section. I think that's basically it. Yeah, I don't recall needing to tweak the scene over much. As I say, I, I didn't use the psychic attack because of the damage. I was concerned about killing a player character. Um, so I think we're okay for now. I can't think of anything I need to add to the scene particularly. So I'm going to save, and I'm going to do my outro. Uh, so, for those who were not here at the start of the show, um, and who may be new to the channel, uh, the best place to go for any news regarding uh, Onyx Path and um, their like project and whatnot uh, is the Monday meeting notes. It's as it sounds. It's the notes of the meeting that they have every Monday, um, and uh, this. Uh, this week's notes uh, are primarily concerned with the fact that we're halfway through the year and kind of a, a retro, a retrospective on how the year so far has gone. Um, it's full of cool art from Crucible of Legends. Uh, however you may feel about Exalted, its art is always fantastic. Uh, quick note on, then there's a note on the crowdfunding campaigns coming this year. Um, the next one is, in fact, Trinity Continuum Aegis. Um, that starts in seven days, three hours, 14 minutes, and a handful of seconds. Uh, and you can use the link I've just posted in chat to um, uh, sign up for pre-launch so you get notified when it goes live. Uh, remaining crowdfunding campaigns for this year are Titans Rising, which is a second Titanomachy book for Scion 2nd Edition. Uh, the World Below, which is the um, story path fantasy uh, game. Um, being developed by, I think, Matthew Dawkins. Uh, and Abyssals for Exalted 3rd Edition. Um, it's Black Book. Well, the Abyssals for Black Book for the Exalted 3rd Edition uh, are all coming at some point in some order this year to, crowd to crowdfunding platforms on the internet. Uh, obviously, earlier this year, we also had the Realms of Pugmire uh, campaign and Onyx Path are looking at ways to add uh, extra options to crowdfunding campaigns like dice, clothing, trays, all of that cool... Uh, associated merch stuff that that, that, that nerds like. Um, there's also some discussion on uh, finding new printers for the, for the physical books. Uh, Onyx Path will be attending Game Hall Con, Save Against Fear and Packs Unplugged, um, mixture of their own booth as well as sharing a space with Indie Press Revolution and or Studio Two as their print as their sales partners. Uh, there's a mention of things uh, relating to the internet, uh, relating to the internet, relating to the website. Uh, projects that have shipped this year already include a bunch of Chronicles of Darkness books, as well as a few 20th, 20th anniversary projects. Uh, Exalted Essence, obviously, um, released recently on Drive Through. Crucible of Legends is over with uh, Paradox for approval. Uh, they came from, and Trinity, Trinity Continuum both have some rule books and supplements coming out that have come out this year as well as obviously some tasty bits. Um, uh, Storypath Ultra brochure is happening. Uh, if you are unfamiliar with what that is, uh, Storypath Ultra is an evolution of the Storypath system that powers you know, Scion, Trinity, Continuum, um, things of that nature. And they're putting out a settingless... Well, it's got some settings in it, but they're putting out a, a core rule manual for Ultra so that you can do with it what many people have done with things like Fate. Um, for example, and, and here are just the core rules. Do with them as you will for your own games, obviously. Uh, currently, uh, Drive Through RPG is having its Christmas in July sale. Much of Onyx Path's PDFs are 20 to 25 percent off. So if you're waiting on pick on uh, discounted prices for any of Onyx Path's PDF material, now is the time. Do that information, if you will. Studio Two is having a sale on, on uh, physical books and screens, and Roll Twenty is having a sale on some virtual tabletop items on the Roll Twenty store. Uh, I just, uh, yep. Uh, Pathcast this week is about Trinity Continuum Adventure. Um, the rest of the sh the um, 
the rest of this week on this channel looks like this all times in eastern semi core rule book going to be more common going forward i don't know stable deaths um uh, i guess with story path it makes sense because and again friendly reminder while I am a freelancer for Onyx Path, I'm not an official representative. These are just, just my thought processes and my reasoning. Um, Story Path obviously powers the vast majority of their systems, of their games, so it kind of makes some sense to have that coarse um, agnostic book that they can use, uh, or core agnostic document, I guess, that they can use to tweak for further games. And then providing that is also, for people to use, is also just something you can do with with that document um as far as i know onyx 20 is only being used for pugmire although i have had an idea that i might pitch at some point for it um but obviously that depends on things um and obviously they can't produce one for storyteller because that's paradox's side of things um, i'm trying to think if they use any other systems i think it's largely story path storyteller and onyx 20 now so I, I don't know is the honest answer. Uh, I It depends how many different rule systems they create, I guess. At the end of the day. Um, all these times are in Eastern uh, Daylight. Uh, so Saturday is the next show, regrettably on the channel, at 9pm. Changeling the Lost Viva, Lost Vegas, which continues to be one of the best show names I've ever heard. Sunday, 9pm, Saron Godsend, and Monday, 5pm, Saron Hero, The Beginner's Guide with Awkward GM. Which, uh, much like this show, is not an actual play. Uh, Corbin, the Awkward GM, uh, runs you through like character creation and how to play the game as an absolute beginner. And it's a useful resource for, for that side of things. It's so useful, in fact, that it's the media highlight of the week for the second week in a row. Um, they're all up in the playlist on YouTube, and as I said at the start of the episode, if you find them useful, if you find them interesting, please do leave a comment, like the video, engage with that YouTube algorithm as best you can, um, because all content creation kind of lives or dies at the behest of YouTube and Twitch algorithms, really. Uh, but but uh, on sale this week, Howls of the Apocalypse, Three Chronicles for Well of the Apocalypse 20th Anniversary Edition. Yeah, the beginner's, the beginner's Guide happens every week, Quarter Square X. Um, and if you go to the Ice Path YouTube channel... Uh, uh, you know what? I'm on the Ice Path YouTube channel right now. Um, so I can, in fact, just find you the playlist. Quick, before the video auto plays. Uh, I mean, I assume... There we go. Here is your RPG Beginner's Guide series playlist covering Scion, Mummy the... Uh, most of Chronicles at this point. A uh, couple of Trinity Continuums, they came from. And as I said, um, please do leave comments, like the video, etc. Engage with the algorithm. Uh, where was I? Yes, uh, three or four chronicles for that. Game Hong Kong, October 19th to 22nd, has uh, an updated exhibitor list with Onyx Path on it. Onyx Path will be sharing Studio 2's booth at PAX Unplugged in at the start of December. Uh, game Night with Onyx Path publishing this month over at Start, Play start Playing Dot Games uh, is focused on Trinity Continuum, and that is a week on Friday. Uh, and then the development status, Sound Tasty Pit Sound Dragon Libraries in Manuscript Approval. Post-approval development, they came from the Cyclopsis Cave, they came from Witchford Academy, which again, super excited about because that's a book I can I, a book I have contributed to. Um, and the rest of the writers and the developer were a joy to work with, and it's going to be a great book. Uh, Exalted Deeds Yet Undone also. In editing, they came from Heroes of Action and Wonder, and they came from Classified Hotel Lobby Tasty Bit. In Art Direction, Exalted 3rd Edition, 8 Directions, Scion Titans Rising, Trinity Continuum Aegis, Kickstarter Material, uh, Trinity Continuum Aberrant with Great Power. In Layout, Legacies of Earth. Uh, proofing, we've got Exalted 3rd Edition, Crucible of Legends, Mage 20, Lore of Tradition, The Traditions, and Trinity Continuum Assassins of ETT Adventure. And then at press, various stages of the at press process from errata to print on demand proofs. Uh, Trinity Continuum Anima, Trinity Continuum Adventure book, Story Guide Screen and Booklet, Exalted Essence, uh, World 20 Apocalyptic Record book, Screen and Booklet, Mage the Awakening, Tome of the Pentacle, 
you know, the Orbelow, Ashkan, and House of the Apocalypse. Uh, if you have enjoyed this show, obviously, please, and you're not subscribed to the Twitch channel here over on Twitch or following, please do consider following or subscribing. This video is exclusive to Twitch subscribers for a week. Uh, if you have an Amazon Prime account, you can link it to your Twitch account for a Prime Gaming account, uh, which gives you one free subscription a month. It does not auto-renew, but it gives you all of the same benefits of subscribing, gives the channel all the same benefits of, subs of subscribing. Uh, if you just like me for whatever reason, oh, hang on, continuing on. Uh, after that week is up, uh, you can watch it on Twitch until Twitch deletes it automatically after I think 60 days. Um, or it will be over at youtube.com slash at Comrade Bubbles, um, which is my YouTube channel, uh, where I organize it into playlists alongside all of the other stuff I do um, for your viewing pleasure. Um, I do also stream on Twitch. Uh, if you are watching this on desktop, uh, if you click at Comrade Bubbles in the, in the stream title, that will take you to my Twitch channel. If not, it is twitch.tv slash Comrade Bubbles. Uh, I do mostly video game streaming, um, but I'm always happy to talk about role-playing games and TTRPG and writing and storytelling in general. And my community over there is, is very welcoming and, kind of, and, and really chill, for the most part. Exceptions exist. Uh, I can also be found on Twitter while Twitter continues to slowly burn um, at Comrade Bubbles. Uh, I'm also Comrade Bubbles on Tumblr and co-host. Um, I'm less active on those sites. I need to get better at posting them, but th those are places you can also reach me if you have lingering questions. Uh, if you have need of the Discord community, Nightbot has been sharing the Discord community link quite frequently. I'm Comrade Bubbles there. I lurk all the time. I rarely post because that's what lurking entails. Well done. I get paid to word good. Uh, and this show theoretically will be back in two weeks, uh, which is the 1st of August. Um, it's an auspicious day because I say it's auspicious where we'll continue and I'll go back through the scenes that didn't appear and kind of try to talk about why I included them and what I was hoping to get out of them um, for that I expect those scenes will be a lot briefer to get through uh, a lot swifter to get through because I have less, less to talk about with them uh, but there we go uh, if you have questions, feel free to ask them. I will be in chat for a couple minutes after the post-roll starts, um, but then I will be ending the stream and heading out for the rest of my day. Uh, but please do stay safe. Please do stay healthy. Please do stay wholesome. Please do come back to the channel. We'd love to see more of you here. And uh, yeah, I think that's it. I'll see you all around. Bye.